So logistic regression, if you think about it, does something, needs to solve a very important problem. <coughs> if we have regression, maybe one dimensional, multiple dimensions, well, we are basically trying to come up with estimates for a continuous value, right? Like house prices or maybe height and weight of a person or I don't know, maybe, you know, number of times the sun shines per day and the temperature, you know, that would be, you know, two variables or maybe the value of maybe 10 different securities on the stock exchange per day. So any of those things are nice regression problems. For classification, you want to predict like a discrete category, like is it a cat or a dog? Or what are the digits? Or, you know, if you have ImageNet, then you might get a thousand classes. And having a large, actually the original Im ImageNet data set has more than a thousand classes, probably over 10,000. But basically, <coughs> you're going to get a categorical discrete output. There are lots of different others. So for instance, on Kaggle, you could try to classify proteins in terms of what they are and what they do. Or you could find out what type of malware you're dealing with. Or, you know, what are toxic Wikipedia comments in terms of, you know, you know, which category they are. Apparently there are prototypes like, hey, I'm not really trying to start an edit war, but of course now I am, right? <laughs> um, so to put that into perspective, so in regression, well, we have like a natural scale typically in terms of, you know, the real valid number. And then the loss is often given to us in terms of, you know, differences between y and f of x. That may not always be the right loss. So for instance, if I look at the stock market, it's probably going to be the difference of the logarithms that I care about. Because whether I'm trading Amazon, which trades at $1,600, or whether I'm trading, I don't know, Facebook, which is probably, I don't know, it's probably $100 or so, but it doesn't matter. Or if I, let's say, or I take a, you know, a penny stock, which trades for maybe a dollar and is close to being delisted, for that penny stock, if it, if its value increases by maybe 50 cents, that's a massive move of 50%, right? And since I might be buying a lot of those, well, I just struck it rich and, you know. On the other hand, if Amazon goes up by 50 cents, well, that means nothing really happened, right? Because the base price was so high. So you care about relative changes. So in that case, you wouldn't look at differences between values, but you would probably look at maybe the log of the ratio as one of the losses. In classification, typically you have many classes and the, the score should somehow reflect the confidence that we have in this. And this is awfully vague, so mm, what could we do? Well, the first thing we could do is we could just use the squared loss, right? So I just encode you know, the classes with a vector of all zeros and one one, right? And I regress on it. That sounds utterly weird, but people have done that, and if you don't care about doing things particularly well, that actually works okay. So there are a couple of implementations, like for instance, VW for some time used that, so Wobble Wobbit. So there are plenty of reasons why you might actually do that, and it's not too bad. And you can even prove theorems that it's not too bad from the statistics side. And then you just pick the largest output and that one wins. But I would strongly advise against it. Uh, but, you know, people do it nonetheless. Okay. You could pick something like an uncalibrated scale. And this is, by the way, what the support vector machine would have done. So <coughs> you, you know, pick the largest output, but you want to make sure that the correct output is much larger than all the incorrect outputs. And so what you have is you get this condition OY minus OI is greater or equal than some delta of Y and I. And this delta tells me, you know, how bad it is to get things wrong. 
So suppose you drive on a road and to your right hand side there's a cliff and to your left hand side there, you know, there's maybe some lawn or whatever. Then when you drive on this road, you will probably somewhat steer to the left. Because it's not so bad if you drive into the lawn, but it's pretty bad for you if you fall down that cliff, right? So you will keep a larger margin relative to the outputs that will incur a large loss. And under the right circumstances, you can engineer this loss function and this optimization problem in such a way that you can actually solve it efficiently. And around maybe 2002, 2003, this was all the rage. So there are probably about three, 400 papers which come up with really nifty tricks on how to do this, of how to solve this with some mathematical programming on the inside and beautiful math. We all played this game and yeah, it was the right thing to do at some time. Um, okay, uh, no, but we're not gonna do that here. Instead, we are going to use something like a calibrated loss scale. And this is just a very simple softmax, yes? Sorry, what, what does uh, O mean here again? O is just the output. So if you look at the diagram on the right, so we have you know, X1 through X4, and then we have O1 through O3. These are the outputs. No, these are just outputs of the network, right? So these are just for the three neurons, the output neurons, that they're just the, uh, the values that they produce. But I have to name the variable somehow, so it's just that. And don't worry, it has nothing to do with big O notation. Um, by the way, you do not need complexity theory to pass this class. Somebody was very worried about that. Um, you don't need complexity theory for this class. This would be overkill. Um, but in here, it's really just a variable name. So the softmax of the output is given by just exponentiating every coefficient individually. So that ensures that all those things are non-negative. That's great, because we want probabilities. And then dividing it by the sum over all those terms. So quite honestly, if you had to hand engineer something that maps a vector to a probability, you might have done something like that as well yourself. Maybe rather than E, you would have picked maybe O Y squared divided by you know, the sum of the O's, you could have done that too. But this one actually has a little bit nicer properties in terms of computing derivatives and so on. And the good thing is the negative log likelihood is this left term down there. This is a formula you should absolutely remember. It will pursue you throughout the entire career in stats. It's about the simplest exponential family you can imagine. You will see this thing again. Okay. Now, <coughs> okay, so is everything sort of kind of clear in terms of logistic regression and what we're doing here. So that this is, you know, gives, gives the probability and so on. Okay. The probability in the red, is that just the y given O? Exactly. So that would be, and yeah, so the, it's a typo. It's one of the reasons why I don't put up the slides before the class. Because I hope that there will be fewer typos after the class. Um, you're absolutely right. Well, I could just fix this now. And there we go. Okay, good. So now, if we have that, well, so this is, you know, a nice loss function and we can plug that in and the good thing is every decent deep learning toolkit comes with a, an efficient implementation of this. <laughs> this is now, I think, also explaining a little bit better why we talked about numerical stability and all of that about a week ago, right? <coughs> because if any of those outputs O are really large, then, well, things can get unstable. Now, quite often people don't, Im don't actually refer to this loss, but they refer to something called a cross entropy loss. And this cross entropy loss looks just like the loss that we had before, 
just that rather than a single Y, we might now have an entire probability distribution over labels. And now I have just Y transpose O. So if Y is coded with just all zeros and one one for the correct class, I get exactly the line above. But more generally for probabilities, I can now compare with that a desired target probability to the probability that I'm estimating. And we'll actually go over some information theory to explain why on earth we get this. But we may not have time today. <coughs> so let's look at the gradient next. So the gradient of this just happens to be, and I'm go going to derive this. this. This is one of those fundamental derivations that will help you. So remember, we had our loss function log sum over i e to the oi minus, and then in this case, oi. OK. And so do is going to be, well, here we have a log. So we get in the denominator sum over i e to the oi. And here, and this is at coordinate, let's call it coordinate y prime, e to the o y prime minus delta y y prime. <coughs> now, what is this expression here? Well, that's nothing else than P of Y given O. P of Y prime given O. This is the empirical probability. So if I were to plug in the cross entropy loss, so in other words, if we have here O transpose Y, I'll get Y out of here. So in other words, what I'm really getting is P of Y, P of y given O, well, I know, of course, now I need to actually plug up, let me call this a probability here, so minus P. So my gradient is now just the difference between the probability that I'm estimating and the probability that I should be seeing. <coughs> so it's, we're basically back to the regression set setting where we compared what we are estimating and what we should be seeing, right? So, and what we are seeing. And here again, we are taking differences between the estimates and what we should be seeing in terms of <coughs> what we're seeing in to get our gradients. Just that this is a more convoluted way of get going about it. Now, this sounds like a coincidence, right? That we're getting differences between truth and expectation. And it's not a coincidence. As a matter of fact, any exponential family will do that for you. Even better, the second derivative of this will give you variances for any exponential family. So this is one of the reasons why exponential families are so popular in statistics, because the math works out really nicely. Yes? So can you characterize again what's the properties that come to the Okay. Um, everybody cool with that so far? Because I'm going to erase it. Okay, good. So in an exponential family, and this is really just a detour here, I have P of X parameterized by theta, or actually, let me, parameterized by W, is given by some phi of X, well, phi X, X transposed W minus G of W. 
So this looks a little bit different from what we saw. This phi of x, in our case, it just keeps the vector the same. And w is then just the corresponding way to fix the thing out. g of w is the normalization. That is this funky log sum over the exponentials term. That basically just makes sure that this is a proper probability distribution. Right? So this is g of w is given by sum over all x's And the nice thing is that the derivative dw of g of w gives me the expectation of phi of x. And furthermore, the second derivative gives me the variance Now, this thing is exactly why the first term here is that probability. Right. Because my sufficient statistics were just the indicators, right? And so the expected value of you know, that indicator function, which is one for, the, one for the, you know, the specific class and zero otherwise, if I take the expectation of that, that just gives me the probability vector. So what we saw here is about the dumbest exponential family you can think of, but it's a very versatile one. This is really just an aside. If this looks too confusing for you, just disregard it. You won't need it for the rest of the class. Any other questions? Okay, good. Now, before we do information theory, and this is, of course, Shannon himself, um, let's look a little bit at how to do regression. And that's about, I think, all that we'll be able to do today. So 